most advanced recruiting techniques. Land the most desirable talent. Launch your company towards massive success. This is the Higher Power Radio Show with Rick Gerard. So no one is interested in working for your ego. Just ask our friend, we'll call him Dick. We changed his name to protect the innocent, of course. Dick is a VP of a small, well-funded startup, and he's very proud of what they're building. So proud that he's established very hard bar for talent, and, and uh, as a result, he's had a difficult time finding people. Let's just say his expectations are a little out of whack. He's got Ferrari expectations on a Hyundai budget. The way in which we interview, or actually the way in which the interview is conducted comes across as being adversarial. Dick comes across as a real, well, you know, Dick. So as a result, some fantastic people have opted not to accept the offer and a negative glass door reviews are abundant. Today is about how not to run off talented people in your interview process and just like our friend Dick. I'm Rick Gerard. Welcome to the Higher Power Radio Show. We help entrepreneurs and business leaders win the right hire. We share insights from top performing rebel entrepreneurs, disruptors, and industry leaders like our guest today, Molly McGrath. Molly is the founder of Hiring and Empowering Solutions. She is a national podcaster, decade-long national blogger, and two-time Amazon number one best-selling author. She has coached, consulted, and directed presidents and founders of national organizations and over 4,000 small businesses in executive level leadership, continuous improvement, and team empowerment initiatives to infiltrate new markets, leveraging partner ecosystems, and producing profitability, which is what makes Molly the perfect expert for today's topic. Molly, welcome to the Higher Power Radio Show today. Oh, thank you for having me, Rick. I'm so excited about today's topic. <laughs> <laughs> not to be Dick. I bet you haven't been on a podcast where you talked about that one, huh? <laughs> All right. So today we're going to have a little bit of fun with this. And by the way, in full disclosure, my dad's name is Dick. He's not a dick, but you know, <laughs> I, I kind of modeled it after him just because, you know, we have a little fun with it. I'm going to tease him next weekend for it. Anyway, uh, so we're going to talk about how not to come across as a horse's ass or a dick in your interview. And then if you've got this problem, if you've got negative glass door reviews, if you've got people that are turning down your offers, we're going to talk about how to fix the problem, uh, even if you are a dick. So, so like fun. <laughs> All right. So let's talk about the challenge today, uh, Molly. I find that, uh, you know, I mentioned ego at the top of the show, but I, I find that there's a lot of people that are in positions of, leadership and they have a bit of an ego us entrepreneurs we have to in order for us to really build our organization but a lot of times that doesn't serve us quite well absolutely yeah you know biggest challenge i see today is that entrepreneurs really don't understand and or believe that it is an employee's market especially in the personal services and the professional space, a higher of caliber of client that or candidate that you're looking for, the, the market's just tight. People are now looking for an opportunity. They're looking for culture. They're, they're interviewing you as a business owner, as an entrepreneur, just as much as you are interviewing them. The days of you should be lucky to have a paycheck or you should be lucky to come and work for my amazing organization are over. And my really, I, I've seen 50, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it, oh my goodness. Especially They've been long it's, over. It's long over. And COVID's given us that gift of people now are really looking for culture so often. And you and I've talked about this before when I interview people, I'm like, why are you looking for a new job? What's going on? Why, why are you applying or why are you picking up the phone and talking to me? And so often they'll say, I'm looking for a new opportunity is what they say. I'm like, all right, great. What does that mean? And really what it boils down to is they want to lock arms with somebody who they respect 
they admire that inspires them every single day. Think about how much time you spend at work, whether it's virtual, on Zoom, in the office, what have you. You're spending a majority of your waking hours there actually working. But if not, if you're working for a rock star company, on the weekends and night, you're thinking about what you can do to bring to the table, what you can do to improve. And that's when you know you have a rock star candidate or employee, but you have to step up as an entrepreneur and realize that recruiting sales, employing people is 100%. It is sales. You're selling your company, you're selling you as an innovator, and you're selling your culture. Now, you brought up a really good point there. Nobody needs a job for a paycheck anymore, right? Mm -hmm. And, and so when I talk to people, there's usually one of three reasons why they're looking to exit their current company. One is lack of growth opportunities. Second is almost always leadership or, or management, right? I think there's a big difference between management and leadership. Leadership, like they're the people that are really like you want to work for management, not so much. Yeah. And, um, and then thirdly, um, they get bored with the work, right? And and so it's your job as the CEO, as the as whoever is leading the company to make sure that you're keeping your people engaged and challenged and, and, and you're fostering their growth. Yeah. You know, I always say you have to remember you're hiring human beings versus human doings, first and foremost. And it's typically the human stuff that gets people either fired or that they leave and it goes on the same side as you as an entrepreneur and as a leader. So often leadership and or management, honestly, whichever way you're coming at it, you need to give your employees time, attention and feedback. And so often you and I talked about this last week, I think it was, when I, I have a recruiting company as well and I get phone calls and the number one thing I hear, I gotta hire someone batteries included. They need to have the, I don't have time to train them. Like, well, even if they have a skill set and the knowledge and they're an absolute superstar to begin with, you still need to give them time and attention. You're the you're the leader. You are a coach and a mentor, first and foremost. And you have to every day when you wake up and you pull into your office building or into your Zoom rooms, what have you, you have to remind yourself. You're, you've got to keep your ego in check, your attitude in check, and really remind yourself that you're re-enrolling your employees every day because we know as recruiters, we're ruthless. We'll inbox everyone. We're, our number one question is, hey, are you happy? Are you being treated well? You want to talk to me? Oh, yeah. And, and, you know, and the funny thing is, is when one person at a company says, oh, my God, leadership here is a mess the whole team just goes after everybody, right? So you're not just gonna lose one person, you're gonna lose a lot of people. Even if it's not true, the perspective of, you know, people, your employees, like you said, it runs like a cancer through the office when people start having the water cooler talk of things of nature and you plant those little subconscious seeds, If they'll look for evidence everywhere to find truth of that. So you have to be really responsible for how you show up energetically. Uh, you know, leaders have to remember you're responsible for the energy you leave in every room, in every conversation, even, and I'm excited to talk about this today, when you're interviewing candidates. You know, so let's talk about how this, why this is important to company. But I think though, if, if you, if you are one of those people that has a huge ego and, and you're kind of a dick, really, you, you have to really own it and make sure you prepare people for it. Yeah. I mean, so, so there's, there's no surprise and you have to hire people that are okay with you being a dick. There's, there are people that will work in that environment and they'll thrive in that environment. Mm -hmm. And step one of anything is awareness. Like you said, if it, if listen, if you're a hard ass to work for and you're unapologetic about it, well, hold your head high and own it and claim it. And there's sometimes when I interview entrepreneurs, see if they'd be a good fit for me to play some, I'll have an upfront conversation with them. Like, listen, you're challenging, you're difficult, you have unrelenting expectations and standards. And if they're like, damn straight, yes, I do. And they own it. I'm like, all right, great. 
I'm, I'm going to be clear with the candidates up front. I'm like, listen, this is not easy street at all. You're not getting unicorns and roses every day. No warm and fuzzy, this type of environment. And there's a small percentage that can hang in that. And they're yeah. like, sign me up. Yep. That's so very true. So why is this important to a company? The, the oh, Knowing what, what seat you sit in, if you're... No. Yeah, I think it's it, like I said. It's one. It's step one to be really aware of it and 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 be aware of the culture that you have. I, I work with law firms, right? By and large, it's a majority of my clients and where I hung my shingle twenty five years. Talk and about those attorneys are super nice and friendly. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, they're easy to work for. Yeah, yeah. I my work cut out for me. I'll tell you, but you I love it. Because if I can get them to take awareness of how they show up, I would say about 85% of them are shocked. They're like, no, no, I don't show up like that. I'm like, yeah, you do. Like, go do a review with all your existing employees and see, and then be really clear on why you can't fulfill p positions, why you can't get people to, and either just name it and own it where you're at and then and then be clear and if you don't like what you're seeing well then that's a different conversation of how to change a culture but yeah. if if you're like i just want people that can stand in this culture and there are people like that then we're just really clear to make our job easier on the recruiting side yeah exactly i think if if people are prepped for something they understand what they're getting themselves into before they show up the day of work and then get a a threatening email, their first email they get from their boss, <laughs> right? Um, so what we're doing as a company is we're saving a lot of money on mishires if we're actually owning this. And then also you're, you're maintaining your brand. You can, if you own it and you're unapologetic about it, you can say, hey, look at this is who we are. We're not for everybody. You probably get a lot less bad glass door reviews. Oh, yeah. I think the number one reason why you can get the, the one, number one way you can get a lot less bad glass door reviews is just to close the process with people, you know, not drop the ball with people. Um, that's where most people get angry because they don't ever hear anything back. And then, of course, then they think about all the negative things and and then they blast you. Yeah. You know, just as much as recruiting is really a sales, we're selling, if you're using internal or external recruiters, we're selling your company. We're selling your culture. We're trying to get the employees to come in and meet with you, whether on Zoom or the candidates or um, in the um, in-face interview. The second part of that is also, to your point, is that through the interview process, you have to treat it just like you would if you're closing a million dollar client. You have to treat it like this is client facing, where you're, again, responsible for what energy and what experience you leave for that candidate now more than ever. I can't tell you how many you you all see people go to a restaurant, they have horrible service, the food, what have you, where's the first place they go social media, Facebook, Instagram, and posting on there. And so you have to remember the experience that you leave for the candidate is that they're going to do the same. So treating walking into your entire interviewing process, especially your hiring managers internally, that they really have to, you have to train them. You have to coach them. You have to meet, sit down with every single person that is involved in this process and making certain like lesson. Number one, if we got to make certain that we know that this is reputation management first and foremost, we have to assume every candidate we interview is hopping onto Facebook before they even put the keys in the ignition to write their experience with us. All right, we're hopping into the how-to here. But um, all right, you're listening to the Higher Power Radio Show. I'm your host, Rick Girard. And for our podcast listeners, we're going to take a quick educational moment from our sponsors. Hey, check out stridesearch.com. There you'll find additional content and resources to help you land great hire. Our guest today is Molly McGrath, and she is the founder of Hiring and Empowering Solutions. We're talking about how not to be a dick or come across as a dick in your interview process. Um, we just started to delve into a little bit about how we solve this problem, right? So, um, you know, what, what would be the three steps, uh, Molly, that you would kind of put in place for, like, let's break it down, like, really easy for somebody so they can plug it into their business, what they need to do in order for them to solve this problem? 
Yeah. So I'd love that in regards to just how to solve the problem of not showing up like a dick in the interviewing process is number one, do an audit on your current interviewing, onboarding and training process. And meet with your employees, treat it as like a mini workshop, 90 minutes, get in a Zoom room if you're still virtual or get to the whiteboard and really look at what we're doing from what are our standards around interviewing all the way from the person that's receiving the resumes. If you're working with the outside recru recruiter, you really want to be able to understand that it's sales and brand recognition first and foremost. So interview your existing employees. You got to make it safe for them because if you are owning that you're a dick or a hard ass or whatever it might be, and you really want to, you're going to have to do some legwork here in, in regards to painting the picture of the truth of the culture, number one, truth of management and leadership. And then also just saying to them, okay, how are we going to package the way that we interview, advertise, get people to come in here to interview what's working, what's not working. Then you name it and you own it. And you really want to be clear on who you are. And then you prepare the people for that. And you want to do the same thing once you hit the interviewing on what we do for onboarding once the candidate comes in and then the training process, because there's nothing worse than if you do hire someone and onboard them and then they leave and they leave because of a breakdown in communication, a breakdown in the picture that was painted for them in regards to the culture or the onboarding and the training process. I cannot stress enough about what, um, how much valuable information is in this. I know you're busy entrepreneurs and you tell us every single day, but this is the greatest investment that you can make is to treat it like a mini retreat, a mini workshop, R&D with your current employees that are there and get crystal, crystal clear. Make sure it's clear, concise, and well communicated across the entire process of whoever's responsible for the interviewing, onboarding, and training would be number one. And Never. really aligning the expectations, right? I mean, yes, sure that people understand. You know, you mentioned a couple of good things there, and the other thing is uh, you got to be open for for people who have you know pretty high IQ or EQ, right? Like they can they can accept the criticism, but like you should make it open mm -hmm. so that people are telling you exactly what they perceive to be going on, as opposed to what they think you want to hear. Too. Mm, yeah. Wow. I love that. Um, I'd, I'd say number two. Right, so your audit, your credit, your first one is auditing your current interview, you know, onboarding and training process, right? Absolutely. Okay. And, 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 and to that point, when you name it and you're really clear and you own it, I would also memorialize that as much as possible. I know mm -hmm. people cringe when they hear the word systems and process, but again, because the person, people that were in the room might not be there in 90 days, 120 days, what have you. So you want to be able to leverage and protect your time and systematize that as much as you possibly can. There is a reason why we had a guest last week that brought up the fact that like, you know, that the difference between an interview process and Burger King drive through is what you know exactly what you're going to get from the Burger King drive through because it's systematized like you're going to get everything the same way every time, whereas the interview process is always a hodgepodge of, oh, God, what happened now? So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, what did what did he say? Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And being really clear with, with what that process is, I can't tell you how many times the deal's gotten killed at the 11th hour because they're ready for offer letter. Everybody's in love. Everyone's happy, what have you. And then at the 11th hour, the entrepreneur's business coach or CEO or life coach, whoever it is, decides we got to throw another assessment into the mix or what have you. And then the candidate gets upset because they're like, where did this? come from that was never outlined what other surprises am I going to walk into on day one so really get clear on that process because it I more often than not we see a kill the deal because there's this you know another tool that's pulled out of the toolbox that was never commuted and communicated up front and center yeah that <laughs> you've never <laughs> experienced that right i've never experienced that but I, I will say though that look you don't have to create a really complicated interview process just have one that everybody knows that everybody can follow and have it simple like you, it doesn't have to you don't need 14 different assessments you just need to gather the right evidence from each person 
to, to be able to support making that hire. That's it. Yeah. So, yes. you know, getting the right data from them. Yes. Rather than, absolutely. hey, where do you want to be in five years? Why do you want to work here? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you know, another way to solve the problem, I would say, and I mentioned this before, is, it, and I probably, I mention it all the time, of treating the interview like you would a million dollar client. You have to, you have to know in this day and age, the days of, you know, show up to work, put your head down, shut your mouth, collect your paycheck and go home are way over. And they have been for quite some time. And now more than ever, based on what we've experienced the past year, you have to understand that you need to show up warm, welcoming, and 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 really inviting. You, like I said, you are you are protecting your brand reputation management. You're also really clear that you want to leave the person better than when they entered your Zoom room or your conference room or however you are interviewing them. And you really want to be responsible for how you're showing up. I can't tell you how many entrepreneurs, we get it. You're busy, you're important, you're stressed, you have more work. If not, you wouldn't be hiring in the first place. But by the same token, you have to understand that, that I cannot say this enough, that whether you hire the person, whether they're a good fit, whether they're not, is not your end all and be all. It's about what, how they are going to leave that interview and what's going to come out of their mouth once they go there. You have to treat it like a Google review because it's so difficult to recover from them. Well, can you imagine like if you actually treated your customers like you treat your um, your interview process or your like people you try to hire? I mean, you wouldn't you wouldn't have any business. Right. Right. Like, you know, like you would you would lose it as a as an entrepreneur, you would lose it if somebody dropped the ball and didn't give feedback back to their customer. Or if a customer called and said, hey, I have a problem and nobody nobody returned the call, and nobody followed up. You would absolutely lose it. Right. And yet when you get somebody in a higher in interview process, I think the number one reason, again, like I said before, when people get bad, bad glass door reviews is because they interview, they say they wrap up, they say, OK, we'll get back to you. And then crickets, nothing. Right. And that's one simple thing that you can that you can fix, um, but you can actually do it at the interview. There's no reason why you can't release somebody at the interview and just say, hey, look, at, you know, it's probably not a fit. And let's you know, let's let's move forward with somebody else or, you know, something to that effect. Anyway, yeah. yeah. And, and, and to your point, I just cannot. Uh, I, I really want to highlight this. You might do a phenomenal job as a business owner and get hired by a client to use your example. Great. And then you do. And then you in comes the hiring manager or the intake coordinator or customer service, whatever it is, and they do a horrible job. And then now you have the reviews. Now you have refunds. Now you have all that. Think of the same way as a candidate. When you end the interview, so often entrepreneurs get all squirrely around this. They're like, I don't know how to end it. So they always just be like, we'll be in touch. And to your point, they don't get in touch and or you delegate that to someone who's never been involved in the interviewing process. So often I've, I've had amazing entrepreneurs that I've hired. I'm like, yes, I can't wait to place your placement. And then in comes their uh, hiring manager or their COO or whatever it is that knows nothing about hiring. They have no clue on how to treat candidates. And to use this example, then you send the person or you tell the hiring manager to be like, well, tell them that we're not giving them a job. And they come in and they're, they like insult them. We don't know what information they're giving them. And that's where all the bad reviews come from it, on Glassdoor, on social media, yeah. which by the way, cannot be removed. They, yeah. they well, cannot be removed. removed, but I think you have to pay them a lot of money. I think it's, I yeah. think you probably, I would imagine that they have something built into their business model because sure for 10 grand, we'll take her, we'll get rid of that or something. Yeah. I, mean, I would if I own Glassdoor. Um, all right. So feedback. Yes. Okay. I take that back. But feedback is, is kind of the last piece, right? 
It is. And when you want to end the interview, so often in, in my recruiting business, I'll hop in Zoom rooms and facilitate the interview with the entrepreneur or what have you. And we'll be sidebar chatting with them. It's like, I don't know how to end this. I don't know what to do. And part of the coaching and the consulting that we do is to your point, give them that feedback at the time and say, listen, you know, use it as an opportunity to be a coach and a mentor and a leader first and foremost and say, you know, right now we're looking for a very specific skill set. You have some of it. You don't have pieces of it. We don't have time to training. So again, you want to take the fault that you're doing them a service as a candidate. And we really need someone who comes with batteries included, what have you. Your resume is great. You interviewed well. I really would be, I will share your resume with my colleagues. If any position, here's some suggestions of what you can possibly, you don't want to go into a deep dive where you're coaching them on what they did wrong on the interview. You want to let them off gracefully yeah. and you want to make certain that you're not oversharing, overgiven, trying to fix them, be their life coach, but you just want to do what you need to do to end it in a respectful way and letting, and then also not creating extra homework for yourself at the end of it and just be upfront, authentic. You don't have to be brutally honest or raw. Well, your suit's not really pressed or no, you're not getting into that. You're just ending it in a way that lets yourself off the hook that you don't owe them any homework homework afterwards by also doing a wonderful representation of their experience with you, whether they get the job or not. You have to remember that the experience and the energy and the essence and the tonality and how you deliver messages in that meeting, in that interview are what you need to be front and center most concerned about. I think that, uh, that, you know, especially if you hire based on corporate values, there's a lot of clients or companies that are doing that these days. Like that's a big part of the hiring decision. You can actually have that conversation. And uh, I've seen it where where people who are in the interview process will actually say, yeah, that's not me. Like I don't align with that. And you can agree that that's not you. And, and you can part ways at that point really, really nicely. And it's usually like a, a kind of a relief for everybody, right? Um, especially again, if you have a, a, a dick culture, right? Like, but you're a collaborative person, you need a lot of attention and you need some mentorship. Um, you know, somebody could say, well, that's, that's not us. We, we'd love to hire you, but that's, you're not going to do, you know, it's not going to be a fit. And I think that right there is just going to create goodwill and, and, and good karma, you know, for the, for the next upcoming person. Indeed. I've had, I've had great, uh, you know, to your point, I think a major miss might be that a lot of business owners, especially small business owners, aren't even clear on what their core values are. So probably no. starting there and getting really clear on that, which is very different than your vision and mission statement. And, and to your point, I've been in many interviews where the attorney shows up or the entrepreneur shows up exactly who they are, right? And they they have the warm and fuzzies and the honest, well-respectful conversations and, and then get deep into the conversation where the candidate's like, you know, the, I don't think this is a great fit for me. And simply just saying, wow, Thank you for being honest and for respecting my time, respecting your time, things of that nature. I mean, that alone is a massive home run. It cuts down your time. You're not wasting any time. We're able to have an adult conversation that yeah. is um, based on respect and clarity. Uh, I mean, what greater win is there and, in that scenario? Yeah. And by the way, you could do that as you start the interview, you just say, hey, if at any time you know, this is part of preparation. If at any time you feel like, hey, we're not a match, just let me know. Yeah. You know. All right, what conversations. Are... Mm -hmm. Exactly. All right. So what would be two or three key takeaways you can give the audience so they can plug into their business today? Yeah. So I'd say number one takeaway would be just be really clear and honest with yourself on who you are and who your culture is. Like we've said, like I've said several times, is that the recruiting and the hiring process now more than ever, the employee and the candidates are interviewing you just as much, if not more than you are hiring, you know, than you are interviewing them. We can tell you all day long, we're recruiters and it, to find good quality candidates, you know, with the, I love the questions that they ask me in the interview process. I'm like, wow, you are a rock star. So you have to remember number one, that hiring, recruiting, 
interviewing is sales, period. You are selling your company uh, first and foremost, and that's your job. That's your role that you play in the entire process. So get clear and own it. Absolutely. And if, and if you have a sales structure, you need to have a hiring structure. Yes. Oh, indeed. Indeed. I'd right. say num number two is that, you know, you have to remember once you employ people, like I said, every day when you're driving into the office or about ready to walk into your business, you have to remember that you are the poster child, if you will, of the culture. So you have to work just as hard at keeping and retaining employees. I would make certain once you have a rock star team and you have people that are creating a tremendous amount of value, you want to make certain that you are pouring into them. You are investing into them. Again, human beings, if they really are a rock star and they're a great employee, then they're getting hit it up on LinkedIn with people trying to offer them other opportunities. I was telling Rick in preparation. I said, my favorite thing is when I reach out to someone and they say to me, nope, not looking. I'm very happy where I'm at. I just want to write the business owner a personal message to say, great job building a culture where people will never leave. So make sure you have employee growth plans in place. Very different than employee review, which feels like your head's on the chopping block and really where you're anchoring into their key performance indicators and spend an hour with them once a quarter, reviewing their goals and setting them up for success and pointing them towards true north. And with that, Molly, shoot, we're just about out of time. It goes by so fast. I know. I want to thank you so much for your time investment today and welcome you to the Higher Power Radio community. Now, what would be the best way in which members of our audience could find you, uh, your books, uh, all that good stuff? Yeah. The easiest way is to go to my website, hiringandempowering.com, and you can subscribe to our weekly uh, podcast that we drop every Tuesday and our weekly blog we drop every Thursday. Awesome. All right. Well, thanks to our listening audience for tuning into this week's episode of Higher Power. A quick thanks to our team, Brian Colburn, Andrea Ballin, and Ayla Gerard. If you're listening to the podcast, please subscribe, review, and share. You can, um, after all, this show's for you, right? So please help us influence the, the uh, way in which this show grows. You can join the Higher Power Radio community at Higher, that's H-I-R-E, Power, P-O-W-E-R, Radio, R-A-D-I-O dot com. Or you can drop me an email at rick at stridesearch.com. Tune in next week. Our guest is going to be Mark Hirschberg. He is the CTO of Averon. I'm your host, Rick Gerard, and you have been listening to the Higher Power Radio Show. Aloha. Yeah. Aloha. Thank you for listening to Higher Power Radio. Catch our LinkedIn live show every Tuesday at noon or download the podcast on iHeartRadio, iTunes, YouTube, or your favorite podcast platform. We appreciate you joining us on Higher Power Radio with your guide to recruitment success. Rick Giraud.